My name is Sam Wagner and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. And today we're going to discuss justice. Justice and equality. <laughs> Can there be any more boring topics? I will try to enliven them for you to make them interesting. The European Social Survey of Justice and Fairness in Europe had this to say in September 2020. Over the past few decades, European societies have witnessed unprecedented increases in inequalities in wealth and income. Faced with more flexible labour markets, skill-based technological change, ongoing demographic change and migration, European welfare models have been unable to effectively address these rising inequalities. Accordingly, continues the report, inequalities in wealth, income, education and other social resources and their consequences for solidarity, social cohesion and democracy more generally have attracted much attention, both in academic and public debate. While some argue that increasing inequalities are always harmful and serve as a proof of growing injustices in society, others see a certain degree of inequality as a necessary component of a market economy. They argue that differences in individual talents, investments made in one's own education, or even motivation, must be rewarded. Whether inequalities are large or small, good or bad, just or unjust, always seems to depend on the normative perspective from which they are illuminated. Empirical justice research shows that people differ in their preference for certain distributions and distribution rules, and thus ultimately also in their perception and evaluation of existing inequalities." End of quote. The pandemic exacerbated income inequality dramatically, but linking income, justice and fairness is a curious mix. The public outcry against executive pay and compensation followed disclosures of insider trading, double dealing and outright fraud. But even honest and productive entrepreneurs often earn more money in one year than Albert Einstein did in his entire life. And this, this fact strikes many, especially academics, as unfair. Surely Einstein's contributions to human knowledge and well-being far exceed anything that ac uh, accomplished by a sundry businessman? Fortunately, this discrepancy is cause for constructive jealousy, emulation and imitation. It can, however, lead to an orgy of destructive and self-ruinous envy. Such envy is reinforced by declining social mobility in the United States, for example. Um, studies by the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, from 2006 and 7, clearly demonstrate that the American dream is a myth. In an editorial dated July 13, 2007, the New York Times described the rapidly deteriorating situation thus, I'm quoting, mobility between generations, people doing better or worse than their parents, is weaker in America than in Denmark, Austria, Norway, Finland, Canada, Sweden, Germany, Spain, and France. In America, there is more than a 40% chance that if a father is in the bottom fifth of the earnings distribution, his son will end up there too. In Denmark, the equivalent odds are under 25%, and they're less than 30% in Britain. America's sluggish mobility is ultimately unsurprising. Wealthy parents not only pass on that wealth in inheritances, they can pay for better education, nutrition and health care for their children. The poor cannot afford this investment in their children's development, and the government doesn't provide nearly enough help. In a speech earlier this year, the Federal Reserve Chairman at the time, Ben Bernanke, argued that while the inequality of rewards fuels the economy by making people exert themselves, opportunity should be as widely distributed and as equal as possible. The problem is that the have-nots don't have many opportunities either." End of quote. 
Still, entrepreneurs recombine natural and human resources in novel ways. They do so to, in order to respond to forecasts of future needs or to observations of failures and shortcomings of current products or services. Entrepreneurs are professional, though usually intuitive, futurologists. This is a valuable service. And this service is financed by systematic risk takers, such as venture capitalists. Surely they all deserve compensation for their efforts and the hazards they assume. Exclusive ownership is the most ancient type of such remuneration. First movers, entrepreneurs, risk takers, owners of wealth they generated, exploiters of resources, they're all allowed to exclude others from owning or exploiting the same things. Mineral concessions, paid patents, copyright, trademarks, they're all forms of monopoly ownership. What moral right to exclude others is gained from being the first is the question. Nozick advanced Locke's proviso. An exclusive ownership of property is, is just only if enough and as good is left in common for others. I'm going to repeat this. Locke's proviso. Nozick elaborated on it. He said that an exclusive ownership of property is just only if enough and as good is left in common for others. If it does not worsen other people's lot, exclusivity is morally permissible. It can be argued, though, that all modes of exclusive ownership aggravate other people's situations. As far as everyone, bar the entrepreneur, as far as everyone are concerned, exclusivity also prevents a more advantageous distribution of income and wealth. Exclusive ownership reflects real-life irreversibility. A first mover has the advantage of excess information and of irreversibly invested work, time and effort. Economic enterprise is subject to information asymmetry. We know nothing about the future and everything about the past. And this asymmetry is known as investment risk. Society compensates the entrepreneur with one type of asymmetry, exclusive ownership, for assuming another type of asymmetry, the investment risk. One way of looking at it is that all others, all other people, are worse off by the amount of profits and rents accruing to owners, entrepreneurs. Profits and rents reflect an intrinsic inefficiency. Another way is to recall that ownership is the result of adding value to the world. It is only reasonable to expect it to yield to the entrepreneur at least this value added now and in the future. In A Theory of Justice, published 1971, John Rawls described an ideal society this way. I quote, One, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. Number two, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both a to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged, consistent with the just savings principle, and b attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality and opportunity. And it all harks back. End quote. It all harks back to scarcity, the scarcity of resources, land, money, raw materials, manpower, creative brains, they're all scarce. Those who can afford to do so hoard resources in order to offset anxiety regarding future uncertainty. Others wallow in paucity. The distribution of means is thus skewed. Distributive justice deals with the just allocation of scarce resources. Yet, even the basic terminology is somewhat fuzzy. What constitutes a resource? And what is meant by allocation? Who should allocate resources? Adam Smith's invisible hand? The government? The consumer? Business? Should it reflect differences in power, in intelligence, in knowledge, or in heredity? Should resource allocation be subject to a principle of entitlement? Is it reasonable to demand that it be just, just or 
nearly efficient. Are justice and efficiency antonyms? The philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau's work is an example of these irreconcilable tensions. On the one hand, he assures us that succumbing to an amorphous general will guarantees a simultaneous attainment of both common good and the individual's welfare and well-being. In other words, of that which is objectively best for the individual. And yet, just as we begin to equate the general will with the market, Rousseau launches into a tirade against the economic dependence fostered by the efficient division and allocation of labor in line with each agent's cooperative advantages. <clears throat> Rousseau regards trading, property, and money as the roots of all evil, injustice, moral decay. Marx took Rousseau to its logical conclusion with his theory of alienation in industrial societies. Philosophers in Nietzsche's mold believed that the very concept of justice was unnatural. Man-made justice sustains the weak and the individual at the expense of the strong and the collective. Nature by comparison. Nature is squarely on the side of the fittest, the well-adopted and the group. And yet, justice is not concerned with survival. It is about equal access to opportunities. Equal access does not guarantee equal outcomes, of course. Equal outcomes are invariably determined by idiosyncrasies and differences between people. Access leveraged by the application of natural or acquired capacities translates into accrued wealth. Disparities in these capacities lead to discrepancies, discrepancies in accrued wealth, normally. The doctrine of equal access is founded on the equivalence of men that all men are created equal and deserve the same respect and therefore equal treatment is not, however, self-evident. European aristocracy well into this century would have probably found this notion abhorrent. Jose Ortega y Gasset, writing in the 1930s, preached that access to educational and economic opportunities should be premised on one's lineage, upbringing, wealth and social responsibilities. A succession of societies and cultures discriminated against the ignorant, against criminals, atheists, females, homosexuals, members of ethnic, religious or racial minorities, the old, the immigrant and the poor. Communism, ostensibly a strict egalitarian idea, founded because it failed to reconcile strict equality with economic and psychological realities within an impatient timetable. Philosophers tried to specify a bundle or a package of goods, services, and intangibles, like information or skills or knowledge. Justice, although not necessarily happiness, is when everyone possesses an identical bundle. Happiness, though not necessarily justice, is when each one of us possesses a bundle which reflects his or her preferences, priorities, and predilections. None of us will be too happy with a standardized bundle selected by a committee of philosophers or bureaucrats, as was the case under communism. The market allows for the exchange of goods and services between holders of identical bundles. If I seek books, but I detest oranges, I can swap oranges with someone in return for his books. That way both of us are rendered better off than under the strict egalitarian version. And still, there is no guarantee that I will find my exact match, a person who is interested in swapping his books for my oranges. Illiquid, small or imperfect markets inhibit the scope of these exchanges. Additionally, exchange participants have to agree on any, an index. How many books for how many oranges? And this is the price of oranges in terms of books. Money, the obvious index, does not solve this problem, merely simplifies it. And facilitates exchanges. It does not eliminate the necessity to negotiate an exchange rate. It does not prevent market failures. It is a price signal. In other words, money is not an index. It is merely a medium of exchange and a store of value. The index, as expressed in terms of, in, as expressed in terms of money, is the underlying agreement regarding the values of resources in terms of other resources, their relative values. 
The market and the price mechanism increase happiness and welfare by allowing people to alter the composition of their bundles. The invisible hand is just and benevolent, but money is imperfect. The aforementioned rules demonstrated in 1971 that we need to combine money with other measures in order to place a value on intangibles. <clears throat> the prevailing market theories postulate that everyone has the same resources at some initial point, the starting gate. It is up to them to deploy these endowments and thus to ravage or increase their wealth. While the initial distribution is equal, the end distribution depends on how wisely or imprudently the initial distribution was used. Egalitarian thinkers proposed to equate everyone's income in each time frame, for example, annually. But identical incomes do not automatically yield the same accrued wealth. The latter depends on how the income is used. Is it saved? Is it invested? Is it squandered? Relative disparities of wealth are bound to emerge regardless of the nature of income distribution. And some say that excess wealth should be confiscated and redistributed progressive taxation and the welfare state aim to secure this outcome. Redistributive mechanisms reset the wealth clock period periodically at the end of every month or every fiscal year. In many countries, the law dictates which portion of one's income must be saved and by implication, how much can be consumed. This conflicts with basic rights like the freedom to make economic choices and mistakes. The legalized expropriation of income, also known as taxes, is morally dubious. Anti-tax movements have sprung all over the world and their philosophy permeates the ideology of political parties in many countries, not least in the United States. Taxes are punitive. They penalize enterprise, success, entrepreneurship, foresight, risk assumption, insight. Welfare, on the other hand, rewards dependence and parasitism. According to Rawls' difference principle, all tenets of justice are either redistributive or retributive. It's about redistribution or retribution. This ignores non-economic activities and human inherent variants. Moreover, conflict and inequality are the engines of growth and innovation, which mostly benefit the least advantaged in the long run. Experience shows that unmitigated equality results in atrophy, corruption, and stagnation. Thermodynamics teaches us that life and motion are engendered by an irregular distribution of energy. Entropy, the even distribution of energy, equals death and stasis. Okay, what about the disadvantaged and challenged? The mentally retarded, mentally insane, the paralyzed, the chronically ill? For that matter, what about the less talented, the less skilled, the less daring? Dworkin in 1981 proposed a compensation scheme. He suggested a model of fair distribution in which every person is given the same purchasing power and uses it to bid in a fair auction for resources that bet best fit that person's life plan, goals, and preferences. Having thus acquired these resources, we are then permitted to use them as we see fit. Obviously, we end up with disparate economic outcomes, but we cannot complain. We were given the same purchasing power and the freedom to bid for a bundle of our choice. Dworkin assumes that prior to the hypothetical auction, people are unaware of their own natural endowments, but are willing and able to ensure against being naturally disadvantaged. Their payments create an insurance pool to compensate the less fortunate for their misfortune and shortcomings. And this, of course, is beyond fantastic. It's highly unrealistic. We are usually very much aware of natural endowments and liabilities, both ours and others, except perhaps for narcissists who are grandiose. And therefore, the demand for such insurance is not universal, nor uniform. Some of us badly need it and want it, others not at all. It is morally acceptable to let willing buyers and sellers to trade in such coverage by offering charity or arms, for, for example. 
but it may be immoral to make it compulsory. Most of the modern welfare program, programs are involuntary. Dworkin schemes. Worse yet, these programs often measure differences in natural endowments arbitrarily, compensate for a lack of, lack of acquired skills, and discriminate between types of endowments in accordance with cultural biases and fads. Libertarians limit themselves to ensuring a level playing field of just exchanges, where just actions always result in just outcomes. Justice is not dependent on a particular distribution pattern, whether as a starting point or as an outcome. Robert Nozick, um, Entitlement Theory, proposed in 1974, is based on this approach. That the market is wiser than any of its participants is a pillar of the philosophy of capitalism. In its pure form, the theory claims that markets yield patterns of merited distribution. They reward and they punish justly. Capitalism generates just deserts. Market failures, for instance, in the provision of public goods should be tackled by governments. But a just distribution of income and wealth does not constitute a market failure and therefore should not be tampered with. Thank you for listening.